Thanks, brother. How you go like this? It's like, you're dead. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to uh, study Daniel chapter 2. Uh, t- Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 3, verse 6. This evening, we're going to have uh, Nebuchadnezzar warning his dignitaries that if they fail to comply with his order to worship the statue, the gold statue of himself, this will result in them being executed. They'll, be, they'll receive the death penalty. So we're going to talk about the death penalty a little bit and unjustified use of the death penalty here by Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to talk uh, some more about this idolatry and the fact that he is commanding or ordering uh, the people in his kingdom to commit idolatry. We'll continue to go talk about that further. And also uh, the fact that he's uh, demanding worldwide worship uh, from everybody in, his, in the world to worship him. And so uh, we are actually see right now, in our, in, we saw that uh, uh, he's joined, by erecting this statue, he's joining church and state. And so we're going to see that this is something that's in the works right now. There's a big ecumenical movement you've heard me mention. And uh, one day what they're going to do is they're going to join all the religions of the world and they're all going to be, uh, they're going to join up with uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, Antichrist kingdom, the revived form of the Roman Empire we talked about in Daniel chapter 2. And they're going, to, they're going to be successfully put those two together, religion and politics. It's something that's been going on for years. In fact, our country started because people were trying to get away from the, 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 the merging of church and state with the European countries. They had state religion, so the people who started this country, originally they broke away from that. They wanted to have their, a religious freedom. They didn't want to have to worship under the state religion. And so uh, this is, why our, this is how our, our, the roots of our country, how it started. So we're going to be talking a lot of different things that we're going to start, we're pulling together here about Nebuchadnezzar and what he is doing in Daniel chapter 3. And then, of course, when we get into uh, the confrontation with Daniel's three friends with Nebuchadnezzar, then we're really going to be talking about some things that I think are going to be, uh, I know, are very important for the Christian church to hear because there's some very big, we're going to uh, find out that uh, in life we're going to have to make decisions. Uh, It may not have life and death situations, maybe that might happen, but there are many such times that we uh, don't face life and death situations. However, they actually, our decisions could, uh, in a, and if we compromise with the devil's world, it could lead us into a, a direction in life where we don't execute God's plan. So some of the things that we're going to be learning in the next couple of weeks are going to really help us in our walk with God. And I think you'll find very interesting and also very challenging. And uh, I, I always remember, when you come to Bible class, and a lot of people don't, uh, don't like it because they'll only come to a Bible class. That, you know, that's why we have the prosperity gospel today. People listening to people you know, like the Joel Osteens of the world who just basically a Christian Tony Robbins, if you want to even call him that. They're not really teaching the word of God. They're not mentioning the gospel. In fact, they're ashamed of the gospel. He doesn't even mention Jesus in one of his books at all. And uh, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, not at all. So uh, in our day and age, I say that because in our day and age, People don't want to be challenged with what's being taught. They just want to sit there, and, and that's we by, by nature we like to be nice and comfortable with ourselves, and we think that you know if we had it to ourselves, we'd never be challenged by God, and we'd never grow up spiritually. But one thing you got to learn, and and uh, I've learned it, and we all have to learn this if you haven't already, is that there are times when the God when the word of God is being spoken, we have to make critical decisions in our lives, and change of attitudes, change of priorities, and if we don't. Uh, if we're not making those changes, uh, we fall backwards. We do not go, if you're not advancing in the spiritual life, you're going backwards. There's no standing still. Standing, it's, all, it's either going forward or you're going backwards. Very important that we uh, uh, listen to what we're being taught as being coming from the Holy Spirit and we want the message to conform us into the image of Christ. So therefore, uh, sometimes we'll receive encouragement, sometimes we'll receive conviction, when I'm studying the Word of God, I get, there's conviction, uh, and there's uh, the, you know conviction for sin maybe, or there's an encouragement. One way or the other, God's Word is doing something in our lives, and uh, the great thing is to let the Holy Spirit have His way with us, and and by doing that, that means we have to make decisions uh, in obedience to God, and to walk by faith, not by sight, and which results in obedience to God. So without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear what the Holy Spirit's going to sp- say to each one of us. Uh, try to get out of your mind that it's Bill Wenstrom or whoever. It's irrelevant who's speaking right now. What matters 
is uh, what's going to be said from this pulpit. And uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, wants to work through all of us. So therefore, it demands that all of us are in fellowship with God. So if we haven't already, now we'll take a moment of silent prayer to, to examine ourselves, to see if we need to confess any sin in our stream of consciousness. And then once we've done that, we're restored to fellowship with God and we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. If there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, uh, Philippians 4, 6 says something similar. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us again out here in Iowa and another day to learn about your plan for our lives, to become like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your son and uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which makes it possible, both of whom make it possible for us to uh, execute your plan. We thank you, Father, for the fact that you indwell us, all of us as believers, and also your son and the Spirit indwell us. We thank you for the fact that both your son and the Holy Spirit are praying for us at this very moment. So we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you, Father, for your willingness to send your Son into the world to become a human being and then to die a substitutionary spiritual and physical death in our place. We thank you for raising him from the dead and seating him at your right hand. And we also thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we received at the moment of our conversion who has uh, placed us in union with your Son, Jesus Christ, has identified us with him and his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session, so that, so that we might experience victory over sin and Satan. So, Father, help us through the power of the Spirit and the Word of God to experience that victory over sin and Satan so that we might continue to grow up to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to understand how important it is to appropriate by faith our position in Christ so we might experience this victory. Thank you, Father, for this study in the book of Daniel and the th lessons that we've been learning. And we thank you for this lesson that we, and the warnings that we're receiving in Daniel chapter 3 with the warnings about idolatry and the importance of obeying you no matter even if it costs us our lives and the warning not to compromise with the devil's world. So help us, Father, in this study in the book of Daniel to understand the lessons that are being taught. We just pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work this evening not only through the communicator, but through the audience. Help those in the audience to concentrate, to understand what's being taught, and then make ap application of what is being taught so that they're conformed by the, uh, the message to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We also pray that you give grace to myself so that I could deliver your full counsel to your people so that they're built up and edified spiritually, and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, are lifted up and glorified. We also pray that you would help Titus and Tyler with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for their work, and we pray that everything would function properly with the, uh, the, the technology in the Thompson household. And we thank you for Titus and Jody opening up their home to us. We thank you for their sacrifice. And Father, we, we just pray that we, with one voice, as a result of this Bible class we, class, we might bring glory and praise and honor to you and your son. So Father, we pray for these things in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. As I noted a few moments ago, we're going to know Daniel chapter 3, verse 6. And this verse records for us Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon in the 6th century B.C., threatening his dignitaries with capital punishment if they fail to comply with his order to worship the gold image that he erected of himself on the plain of Dora in the province of the city of Babylon. Now look at uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Now remember... Uh, first of all, before we read this, the first, these first six verses of the chapter, uh, remember what we got going on here. Nebuchadnezzar, we've seen so far, has erected this image. It's all of gold. It's 90 feet tall. It's 9 feet wide, as we saw. And it's, it's solid gold. And there's a connection between the gold head of the statue in his dream, which Daniel told him was 
him, his kingdom, and this gold statue, the solid gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected of himself. <clears throat> As we've seen, it's his, he's expressing his rebellion against God. The revelation he received in that dream in Daniel chapter 2 should have caused him to humble himself before Daniel's God, the God of Israel, Jesus Christ. But it, it did not. And he has rejected it, the revelation. He's only accepted that part which pleased him, which is a problem unbelievers have today. And also even believers have today. They pick and choose what they want to listen to and apply. So we need to learn that lesson. We can't be like that the way Nebuchadnezzar is. So we have Nebuchadnezzar's rebelling against God. We also see he's erecting this statue because he's trying to unite his kingdom. Remember, he conquered nations like Israel and, uh, and, and Edom, we've seen in the past, in Jeremiah 27. So he's trying to unite these various provinces in his vast kingdom and all these nations that he's subject, subject, uh, subjugated to himself and trying to unite them with this, the joining of religion and politics. And what, this is what we got going on here. It's religious, this ceremony, because he's telling them to worship this image. And it's political because he's trying to use this as the, uh, to galvanize, to unite these various ethnicities and la uh, language groups and nations that are in his kingdom. So he, this is one of the, the two of the reasons why he's doing this at this particular time. And the other, of course, is his tremendous pride. And uh, like Satan before, uh, before him in eternity past, uh, God had given Satan everything that he has, his great wisdom and beauty and his position. And uh, we also saw that God did the same thing for Nebuchadnezzar, yet Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's a self-made man. He's rejected like Satan. He's rejected that revelation that God has given him. He's rejected the reality of the whole thing. And so now he's, re he's rebelling against God. So those are the three reasons why, main reasons why he has uh, erected this gold statue of himself. One, pride. Two, he's trying to unite the various languages and uh, language groups and ethnicities and nations in his kingdom. And uh, so we see there, and he's also, he's also trying, to, uh, he's trying to not only unite these people, but he's also uh, rebelling against God while he's doing this. Those are the three main reasons. Now look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold the height of which was 60 cubits. As we saw, that's 90 feet tall. And it's with six cubits. That's nine feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dora and the province of Babylon, in the province of the city of Babylon, to be uh, specific. Verse 2, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges and the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed to you, or as we saw, to all of you, the command is given, O peoples, that's actually nations, not peoples. The next word, nations, in the New American Standard is referring to ethnicities, the various ethnic groups in his kingdom, and men of every language, in particular language groups. And then here's the content of the command, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psalter, the bagpipe. The bagpipe we saw is actually speaking of percussion. It's drums. And then all kinds of music in addition to this. So he has an orchestra there. And you are to fall down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Notice at the sound of the music, you are to hit the deck and worship this image. Then he says, here's a warning, which actually is going to compel all the dignitaries to bow down, except for Daniel's three friends, of course. But whoever, he says, does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now, remember, we pointed out, if you notice the repetition, how many times it, that we see in the first six verses where it says that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set this image up several times. And then we have, uh, we have the list of the, dig uh, the dignitaries in verse 2, and then the same list is repeated again in verse 3. So what's the, what's the 
uh, the purpose of such, uh, uh, such uh, uh, repetition. Well, there's a reason for it. It's a rhetorical device and not uncommon with the biblical writers in the Old Testament. And it's emphasizing the enormity of Nebuchadnezzar's sin. It's important that we see the purpose of this, uh, 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 this uh, particular um, uh, repetition. So he's emphasizing how bad a sin he's committing. Why is it such a bad well, sin? Well, first of all, not only is he uh, causing everybody and compelling everybody with the threat of the death penalty to worship him, only God should be worshipped, but he's saying, especially in light of what he received in chapter 2, you'd think he'd bow down, of course, but he's not. He's in pride and arrogance. So he has, this sin is not only a sin because he's committing it himself of uh, demanding worship, but he's also commanding others to do so. And that's a tremendous sin. It's prefiguring, as we saw, foreshadowing what Antichrist is going to do during the 70th week of Daniel. And what's interesting, there's a lot of, ty a lot of typology and prefiguring here in this chapter. Uh, we see here that uh, the Daniel's three friends, they represent Israel. They foreshadow Israel during the tribulation period. And the fiery furnace that they're thrown into is speaking of the great tribulation period of Daniel's 70th week. In particular, the last three and a half years we've mentioned. And we'll note in the future when we get to Daniel chapter 9. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he's prefiguring or foreshadowing Antichrist. And what's interesting is that Daniel is missing. And what do you think that prefigures? Anybody take a guess? That is? It prefigures the church. The church is nowhere to be found. They're nowhere found in the tribulation period. So Daniel is actually a, a, a picture, a type of the church. The church is not going to go through the tribulation period. So get, so this is a, a lot of things tied up in this chapter that are foreshadowing future events during Daniel's 70th week. Now, verse 6, if you notice, is an, it's actually an adversative clause. The New American Standard uses the word but to start off the verse, which is a good translation because... It's, uh, the it's translating the conjunction wa, which is introducing a statement which presents a, a, a contrast with the previous statement in verse 5. So here in Daniel 3, 6, this is an adversative clause, this statement here, because verse 6 stands in contrast to Daniel's statement in verse 5, which records again the herald uh, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar commissioning, uh, commissioned announcing to the dignitaries that they were to fall down and worship the gold statue that he erected of himself. So Daniel 3.6, we see, records Nebuchadnezzar warning these dignitaries through the herald that failure to comply with this order will result in them suffering the death penalty. So therefore, the contrast between verses 5 and 6 is this. It's a contrast between obedience to the king's order to worship the gold statue he erected of himself and disobedience to this order. Now, mind you, everybody's going to bow down, but three guys aren't going to. Look at verse six, uh, uh, verse 7 for a second. <clears throat> it says in verse 7, Therefore, as a result of this warning, at that time when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psalter, the bagpipe, or in other words, the drums, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that were there represented by the dignitaries fell down and worshipped the gold, golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now today, uh, we might not, in, in our day and age, people might, might not bow down to a gold statue like here, but they do to other things. People bow down, as we've been pointing out, to money. Uh, that's their god. Sports is their god. Politics might be their god or a political figure. Uh, it could be a husband or a wife. It could be uh, it could be a whole. It could be a house. It could be a sports figure. It could be a musician. It could be a band. It could be yourself. Uh, it, it, anything, but don't worship Jesus Christ. That's who's promoting this idolatry here. Satan, as we saw in Deuteronomy thirty-two seventeen last evening, and and also First Corinthians chapter ten verse twenty-one. Demons are behind the wor uh, idolatry. And again, idolatry <clears throat> is anything you put ahead of your relationship with God. And it could be cigarettes. It could be anything where you put your devotion and your, 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 uh, your, um, your devotion and your energies toward this thing or an entity. It could be an inanimate object or a, a, some, a person. 
So this is something that we, this is the nature of us. That's the way we're made. If we'll worship, we'll wor- that's the way we're designed to worship. So if we're not going to worship Jesus Christ, we're going to worship something else, whether it's ourselves or all these other things I've mentioned. Now, the crowd here that's assembled, like the rest of the world today, everybody's bowing down to the devil, whether they realize it or not, except for those who are bowing down to Jesus Christ. And so we see here that they're doing that because Satan, if he's promoting idolatry in the world today, meaning putting, uh, uh, it's trying to seduce people away from worshiping the true and living God, Jesus Christ. He is, in effect, causing these people to worship him because he promotes the worship of idols. And uh, whether it's money, again, or sex, or it could be that, it could be a whole bunch of things, as I, some of the things I listed. So in our world today, the most people, especially unsaved people, they're bowing down to the gods of this world which Satan has put up, and to divert worship away from Jesus Christ. And sadly, even Christians are doing this today because they're not putting Jesus Christ as number one in their priorities. They're not listening to the word of God on a daily basis. They're not submitting to the authority of their pastor as they're told to in the word of God. And Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, and other passages, they're, not, they're forsaking the assembling of themselves as is the habit of many. And they're doing everything that they shouldn't be doing and they're being falling in love with the world, which 1 John 2, 15 warns us not to do. James chapter 4 says, he, he, he rebukes those Jewish Christians in James chapter 4 for getting involved in spiritual adultery. They're cheating on their Lord by falling in love with these other gods. So what we see here in chapter 3 with all these dignitaries which represent the various language groups, ethnicities, and nations in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, they're bowing down. They've made their choice. I'd rather live and worship a false god than than say no to him and to to worship the true and living God. So they've made their choice. And mind you, this is another thing that's quite interesting. They're doing right here, many of these people who bow down, they're actually doing something that people do today in many churches. It's putting on a show. They're not really, do you think a lot of, all of these people were bowing down to this image because they really thought this was their God? No, they did it because they want to save their lives. They're involved in the, 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 uh, the, the fall, it's uh, all a, a facade, hypocrisy. Nebuchadnezzar is so full of himself that he can't see that most of these people are not even worshiping the image because they want to, but because they're forced to. And so, and so we see here that, uh, that, that uh, in our world today, that people go through the, the rigmarole, they go to church, they go worship somewhere, and it's all for show. And they do it, they go because it's to keep a family member happy or a husband or a wife. They're not doing it because they really want to worship God or Jesus Christ. They're just doing it to keep somebody happy and placate them. So what we see here is something that's going on even in our day and age. So verse 6 is comparing, Daniel 3, 6, it stands in contrast with verse 5. Therefore, if you compare these two verses, the contrast is between these dignitaries obeying the king's order to worship the gold statue or disobeying this order. So it's, as I said before, it's setting up a confrontation with God's people. And this is something that's right down our alley, people, because you and I are going to be confronted with this. If you haven't already, you will be, because you're always going to be confronted with this. Do I obey God, or do I give in to what the world says? Do I do what the rest of the crowd goes and does? Now, as I said before, we it's very subtle. We might not have the threat of death. You know, our obedience might not result in in our physical death, being executed like it will happen with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But, but Christians do this. They'll take the money instead of saying no to the money because the money will take them in the job because it'll take them away from Bible class. They'll, they'll, take, they'll go and get, oh, I can get a better job and I can make more money, but what's the result going to be? I've had people come up to me, so what do you think about this? I said, well, you know what's going to happen is that it's a bad deal because is it going to keep you away from Bible class? And usually they'll lie to me, and I know they're lying to me. It's like, no. Well, then sure enough, they take the job, they get more money, but Bible class is gone. They're not worshiping with God's people. Sin. 
Okay, and I've had I've had the, I've had been confronted with that. Do I take the money? Take the better job? I've taken pay cuts, and uh, where I could have got made more money. Heck, I I could be making more money doing something else right now than being a pastor. That's for sure. I mean, I'm sure some of you guys could make a lot more money if you didn't come to Bible class so much often. You could take another job at night or something, or maybe you could do better for yourself. I don't know, but everybody's got to make up their mind. It, it, you know, because Satan thinks everybody's got a price, and you know what? All, most people do, and so uh, these the people here and, and Daniel, it's their lives. But we're not confronted with that right now. We might be in the future as Christians. Our obedience might, to God might result in our physical death. We might get executed someday in the future. We don't know. But we see today we have a big we have decisions that are, are have consequences as well. Uh, I mean, I've had people. I've told you this, people who, they're going to marry an unbeliever. God says not to do it, but they go right ahead and do it. <clears throat> Why'd you do that? Because they went by, they, the, the wife or the girlfriend or the boyfriend, they was a, it was a God to them. It, that was more important to them to keep them happy, to marry them, than to please God. God said, no, you won't please me. And there's people do this all the time. Pastors do this. Pastors won't teach they won't teach something like the book of Romans because they know they're going to lose people because Paul's tough sometimes. So people will go. They won't teach it. They won't teach it. They'd rather do things on marriage and things for kids, which is nothing wrong. The Bible teaches on it. We've taught on those things. But they'll do those things as hobby horses so that they can keep the people and keep the offerings up. They're not obeying God. They're kidding themselves. There are people, there are people who tolerate women pastors. Women are forbidden to teach. They don't have the gift. They're not allowed to teach in the local assembly when men are present. And that's clearly seen, seen in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women can't be the husband of one wife. Yet why do we have Christian churches doing this, allowing that? Because they don't want to tick off the ladies. They don't want to tick off the ladies. So that's why people like, and, or, or guys, they, how many, t many pastors will not say, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. Husbands love your wives like Christ loved your church. Or they won't say, uh, wives, obey your husband in everything. Why? Why won't they say that? Because they know the ladies will get mad and they're out of the church. Got to keep the offerings up. Got to keep the people together. And we don't want to tick anybody off. They're politicians. They're not pleasing God. Let me tell you something. If you, as a pastor... You've, you've, you've compromised, just like these people are doing in Daniel. They're compromising. You can't compromise. If you don't compromise, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have persecution. You're going to be criticized. You're going to be slandered. And that's the way it is. So do you want... Now, a lot of people won't, can't take that. They like everybody to love them. And if somebody thinks... If, you, if somebody, especially out here in Iowa, in small towns and that stuff... Oh my gosh, the people can't stay. They're more people pleasers than God pleases because they're, they don't want their neighbors to think bad of them. So they'll, they'll do anything to make, keep everything that, that well, human relationships going well, but they forsake God. And they'll, they'll compromise just to be a people pleaser. Saul, King Saul did this. King, God said, I want you to wipe out the Amalekites. Everybody, men, women, and children. <laughs> and he kept, he didn't do it. And God said, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. I'm going to give it to David. David will obey me. Why? Saul was a people pleaser. In Jesus' day, many people didn't follow Jesus because if you did and identify with Jesus, you're thrown out of the synagogue. Now, what's that a big deal? Well, as a Jew, you lost everything. Your business, nobody would do business with you. Nobody would marry your daughters or your, your, your sons. You were ostracized from Jewish society, cut off. So they made a choice. We're going to follow the crowd and, and we won't follow Jesus. So don't tell me people aren't making those choices today. They're making it today. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. I've seen men into the word of God, come, do, you know, into the word of God, into the ministry, and then they get married and they're gone. I can think of a few couples that I've married that have stuck around and actually up their intake of the word of God and they're sitting in front of me. That's very unusual from what I've seen because well, you see, usually the norm is you get married and 
you know, see you later, the Bible class. It, that goes right down. But when they're trying to get married, they're trying to impress you, so they show up all the time. And then as soon as they get married, see you later, they're gone. Because they use this. And also, they're idolaters. Because pleasing each other is more important than pleasing God. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't please your wife or your husband? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying she or he does not come first for obedience to God. Obedience to God comes first, period. And you've got to make a choice because you're going to be, look at, look at Abraham's life. Abraham had to make choices. Do I obey God or do I, do, or do I not do that? Abraham, leave your family and go to a country I will show you. When you get there, I'll show you what it is. He did. He delayed a little bit in Haran, but once his dad died, he went down there. How about Mo when he, Abraham was, to, I love this story, and I've said it before. Isaac, you waited him for him your whole life. Now I want you to, I want you to sacrifice your, your son. Now, what would you have done at that point? Most people would have said, I ain't doing that. Because Abraham said, Obeying God is more important than even my son who I love. Didn't Jesus say, in Luke 14, we studied a couple weeks ago, you love me, you love my, your mother, your husband or wife, a, a mother, a father, son, sons, children, more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Jesus didn't tolerate any rivals. Remember, remember the guy who was, we mentioned it last night, the guy who, uh, who, who said, uh, oh, you know, Lord, um, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, okay, um, he says, uh, sell all your possessions and then give them to the poor and then go come and follow me. And he went away sad. You know why? Because money was his God. He couldn't do it. Jesus said, uh, you know, his, uh, his father died. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Why did he say that? Because he, he, he wasn't saying dishonor your father like that. What he meant is, this is what's keeping you is your human relationships, your father and mother are keeping you away from following God. Jesus was doing that all the time. So what's this all, be, why do I bring, make all these examples, give you all these examples? Because what we're learning here in Daniel chapter three is critical. It's teaching us obedience to God is most important. It's the essential thing. And we have to obey God, even if it means costing us human relationships, costing us money, costing us our, even our own lives. And let me tell you something. And I've, I've thought about this many times and prayed on this. If following Jesus hasn't cost you something in your life, you're not following him. It's got to have cost you something in your life because it always does if you're following him. If you've never had to, if nothing has ever been you, you, uh, that you valued and you've lost it to follow Jesus, like all of his apostles left everything to follow Jesus. If it hasn't cost you anything, if you haven't had to sacrifice anything, you're not following him because he demands these things from us. He demands total allegiance. He doesn't, he doesn't tolerate any rivals. So this is so important that we see this. Abraham understood this. He tested Abraham's obedience. Now, these, we have a contrast here in Daniel 3, 6, between obedience to the command or disobedience. Disobedience will result in your death. But nobody, nobody makes a stand here except for three Jewish men who are Jewish captives who are in foreign territory and, 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 a, and, a, and a very uh, a, a place to them is very hostile. Now, look at verse 6. He says, but whoever, that word whoever is actually two words in the Aramaic. We have the indefinite pronoun mon, and then we have the particle d. Now, these two words are employed together, and they're correctly translated here by the New American Standard as whoever. And the reason why is, they, is that they function together as a marker of indefinite reference. What I'm saying is it's speaking of an unidentified individual or hypothetical individual in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom who might refuse to worship the gold image he erected of himself. Now, when he says does not fall down, it's composed of two words in the Aramaic. We have the negative particle law, translated here not. It's negating the meaning of the pa'al, imperfect form of the verb nephal, which is translated here fall down. Now, this word means to fall down. It means to prostrate oneself before someone, as we saw 
last evening. We saw this word last evening. It means to fall down before someone or something in order to express your humble submission to that something or someone or to honor them or to show them respect. Its meaning, as I said before, is emphatically negated by the negative particle law, which is a, a marker of emphatic negation. And therefore, if you put these two words together, they refer to the refusal of any of the satraps, mili military commanders, governors, advisors, treasurers, lawyers, and judges from the provinces in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom uh, to prostrating themselves, refusing to prostrate themselves before the statue. So together, these two words talk about their, a refusal of someone in his kingdom someone among the dignitaries who will not worship and fall down and worship this image. So now when it says and worship, it says in verse six, but whoever does not fall down and worship and worship is a purpose clause because the word and there, it's the conjunction wa and it's functioning as a marker of purpose. So that means we saw this last evening. It's introducing a statement which presents the purpose of, of Nebuchadnezzar ordering the dignitaries to fall down. Why are you falling down? Think about this. It can't be just and worship, but whoever does not fall down and worship, it means, but whoever does not fall down in order to worship, because what's the point in falling down? To worship. I mean, we could fall down for a number of reasons. Fall down and, you know, play Simon Says. Everybody, saw, Simon Says, fall down. Everybody fall down. I mean, would it fall down to what? Roll on the ground, scratch your back like a dog, you know? What's the reason? To fall down to worship. So we have a purpose clause here when it says, and worship, we could translate it in order to worship. So this conjunction, wa, translated and, is introducing a statement which says that these dignitaries were to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. So the words indicates that Nebuchadnezzar ordered these dignitaries to fall down before the statue of himself at the sound of the orchestra in order to, quote unquote, Worship this image of himself. The word worship there, sagid is the word. We saw it last evening. It refers to the act of committing idolatry. So here, the subject of this verb is the dignitaries in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And they're ordered to assemble here, as we saw. And they're receiving the action of this verb. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, and receiving the action of this verb is the statue that Nebuchadnezzar set up. So therefore, this word sagid, worship, it indicates that Nebuchadnezzar was warning these dignitaries that if any of them refused to fall down in order to worship the image of himself when they heard the sound of the music, they would be executed. So we're talking about idolatry here. And uh, again, idolatry is not just worshiping a figurine. It could be worshiping a tree. Uh, uh, we could be worshiping a, another person. We could be worshiping ourselves, a musician, uh, a money, an inanimate object, anything you put ahead of your relationship with God is idolatry. And what I mean by that is that what do you put your devotion and affections toward? What do you put your energies for? What's a priority? I like to put this example out there. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I, sports was. And baseball and football, all the sports, I knew, I, I knew, you know, I had all the baseball. I was a, a, a wicked idolater because... I mean, it was not that the that collecting baseball cards and knowing all the batting averages and playing baseball all the time was a sin in itself. It was the fact these it was it's nothing wrong with it, but it was something wrong with it because I was worshiping sports instead of Jesus Christ. That's what made it wrong, because he just he he was the one who needed my energies and demands my energy and my devotion and my affections. When then after that was music. I played guitar six, seven hours, eight hours a day. Nothing wrong with that, but I totally disregarded Jesus Christ. So we have here, so what I'm telling you is, what, you, what do you put your affections, what is your effect, what do you find yourself, what is your passion? Is it the word of God, Jesus Christ? What's your passion in life? Is it, you know, some people, it's watching television. It, it could be whatever you put your energies, whatever is a priority for you, Whatever is the most important thing in your life, ask, it, ask yourself, what could I not do? What's, is there anything in my life that I could never do without? Some people, if you took television away, they couldn't do without. They go crazy. That's a sign that they're involved in idolatry with their television set. Some people, you take away, you take away sex. You could take away money and they'll fall apart. 
It's a sign. It's telling you something. God's trying to tell you something if he's taking it away. So if you took, someone took your study of the word of God away, how would you feel about that? What would you feel about that? So I ask these questions because, these rhetorical questions, that because you need and I need to answer these questions because it's going to tell us where we're at spiritually with God. Are we involved in idolatry in some area of our life? Could there be something in my life that's keeping me from being totally dedicated and devoted to Jesus Christ? Or is there something that's dragging me away? Could be a, it could be a, a relationship. It could be a house. It could be a job. It could be money. It could be anything. So you got to make these serious dis- decisions as a Christian. What is God trying to tell me as he's speaking to a Pastor Bill? Now, so idolatry is something we have to be weary of. And it's a sign. Idolatry is actually, as we saw in Romans 1.18 through uh, 23 last night, is a sign of, total de- of the total depravity of mankind. We're sinners by nature and practice, and we have no merit with God. Now look at verse 6. He says, but whoever does not fall down in worship, then it says, shall immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now the, the word immediately, that's several words in the Aramaic. We have the preposition bet, and it's not translated. Its object is the third person, feminine singular, pronominal suffix, he, which is translated, uh, actually could be translated it. And then we have the word Sha'a, which is translated here immediately. Now, the, these three words are employed together as a temporal marker. And that they literally mean, it's important because it's going to tell us something here, what Nebuchadnezzar is saying to them. It means in that hour. It doesn't mean at the exact moment. It means within that hour, literally. It means in that hour, or you could say during that very hour, is probably good, really good, or immediately. So these, this preposition bet is a temporal marker. It means at, referring to the hour in which any of the dignitaries refuses to worship the image of the king. Now, the pronominal suffix he means that, and it's functioning like a demonstrative pronoun, pointing out the noun sha'a, which refers to a period of time in which one of the dignitaries will be executed for not obeying the king's order. So these three words together form an expression which literally means in that hour or during that very hour. And they speak of a specific period of time or point in time after a prior point of time implying a virtually simultaneous action. Now, what's the prior point of time here? Here, the prior point of time would be the playing of the music by the orchestra, which would signify that the dignitaries were to fall down before the statue. The point of time after this would be the dignitaries refusing to fall down. So therefore, this expression indicates that Nebuchadnezzar is warning the dignitaries that if they refuse to fall down in order to worship the gold statue of himself when the music begins to play, they will immediately or during that very hour or in that very hour be thrown in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. So this word emphasizes with the dignitaries that their execution will be swift and he has no problem killing you. He has no problem. He had no problem executing his wise men. Daniel saved their butts. So if the wise men, we brought this out a couple of nights ago, maybe it was last night. If he was, if he was uh, not, if he was quick to execute the wise men, who were the most respected people in all of, of the Babylonian kingdom, what, what, what is anybody, one of these dignitaries to him? They're nothing to him, especially three Jewish uh, exiles that are in his kingdom that he graciously promoted to be the administrators over the, the province and city of Babylon, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So this expression, people, is not saying that at the very moment they refuse to worship the image they'll be thrown in the blazing fire. Rather, it simply means that in that very hour they would be executed. Why? Because it would take a certain amount of time to arrive at the place of execution. What this phrase is telling us, it implies that the place of execution was not right there. They had to go to another place to go for the execution where there was a great furnace. And executing people by burning them alive was common in Babylon at that time. Nebuchadnezzar did that quite a bit. So this is all with the understanding that the place of execution was not on the plain of Dura, but somewhere in the city of Babylon, or at least in close proximity from the city itself. Now furthermore, 
Daniel 3.19 says that Nebuchadnezzar ordered the executioners to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated when they were attempted to executed, execute Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel 3.19, along with this expression here in Daniel 3.16, implies that the fire at some unknown location was already ready and waiting for the individual who refused to comply with Nebuchadnezzar's order. Now, then he says, at the, in verse 6, as we come near the end of the verse, he says uh, in verse 6, but whoever does not fall down in order to worship shall immediately be cast, it says, into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Shall be cast is the verb remah, which means to be uh, not cast, like throwing a rock or something. It means to be deposited unceremoniously into the midst of a furnace blazing with fire. It doesn't mean to be thrown, like I would throw uh, my golf ball into the water after I just sank a nice birdie putt. <laughs> joke, that's a joke. I actually birdied the first hole today, Titus. And I, 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 I didn't break 90, though. I, I hit some nice shots and I hit some bad shots. So we hear, you see this word shall be cast. It's the verb rama. It means to be placed unceremoniously into this furnace. So the idea of the word is it, they would be treated in a rough and hurried manner and they would be deposited. So they had to go and drop them in is what the idea, okay? They weren't picking them up and chucking them in there. They tied them up and everything. So it means to be deposited unceremoniously into the furnace. Unceremoniously simply means this, in a rough and, rough and hurried manner. That's what it's the idea. So the word, though linear movement, is understood by this term. It does not denote the hurling of an object, like I mentioned, like hurling the golf ball, into, or hurling the baseball onto the field. It doesn't mean that. Rather, it refers to placing a person or an object in a rough and hurried manner. That's the idea with this particular word. So therefore, this word is used within a hypothetical member in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom as its subject, and the unexpressed agency is Nebuchadnezzar, or specifically one of his executioners. So this verb, when it says, shall be cast, it actually denotes that if any one of the dignitaries refuses to comply with the king's order to worship the gold image of himself, they would be immediately and unceremoniously deposited, or in other words, they'd be placed in this furnace in a hurried and rough manner. And this tells us the disdain that Nebuchadnezzar has for, for anyone who dares to defy him. Has anybody ever defied Nebuchadnezzar? Probably only a soldier, a soldier, a king and a nation that fought him in war. Other than that, no one would dare take him on. He has all these people, dignitaries, they're not going to take him on. They know he's a killer, and they know he's a dangerous man, and you don't mess with him. So all this corresponds with the fact that the executioners who placed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the midst of the furnace of blazing with fire were killed by the leaping flames. So what they did is when they went to deposit them into the thing, the flame, because he heated it so, seven times hotter than normal, when they went to put him in there, they were killed by the flames. They were immediately killed, and they were strong, and they were valiant warriors. He actually wasted uh, th uh, lives of several of his great soldiers because he was such a hothead it's by throwing these guys, depositing them unceremoniously into the furnace. Now, the last part of the verse, into the midst of a furnace, a blazing fire is a prepositional phrase that begins with a preposition le, and then its object is the noun ga, which means the midst of, and it's modified by the, the construct form of the noun atun, which is translated here correctly, furnace. The word for fire is the word nor, and the word for blazing is actually a verb in the participle form. It's the verb yakad, and that's translated correctly, blazing. Now, the noun ga, translated here in your Bible's as the midst of, it's correctly translated. It's the object of the preposition let, as I pointed out. And that preposition means in. And it's function because it functions as a marker of location, that means to us it's indicating the exact location in which Nebuchadnezzar will deposit unceremoniously and immediately any individual who defies his order to worship the gold in image of himself. Now, this word is in the construct state. 
It's uh, the word ga, and it, that means it's governing the noun which follows it, which is atun, meaning furnace. So this expresses a genitive relationship between these two words, and specifically that of possession. And that would mean that the word ga, the midst of, belongs to this noun furnace, atun. The latter is also in the construct state, meaning that it's governing the noun nur, fire, which follows it. The genitive relationship there is attributive, meaning that the noun nor fire is describing the construct noun a tune furnace as fiery. So the word fire there should be tra- because of this construction can be translated as an adjective fiery. The word for blazing correctly translated yakad it refers to a blazing fire which produces a relatively very high degree of heat. Now, now we knocked off what the words are there. What is this? What is this statement saying? Well, there's several things going on here as we close in the last uh, ten minutes or so, fifteen minutes of the class. In Daniel three six, we have Nebuchadnezzar warning those assembled at the dedication of the gold statue that they're going to be immediately and unceremoniously executed if they refuse to comply with his order to worship the statue of himself. So this is a clear example of unjustified use of the death penalty by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar and all governmental authorities, according to the word of God, have been delegated authority by God to employ capital punishment of capital crimes. So we see here that Nebuchadnezzar is ordering his subjects to commit idolatry, which is prohibited by God, as we saw in previous classes in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 23. Thus, Nebuchadnezzar's threat here to execute those individuals who refused to worship the image of himself, is unjustified. And that's in God's eyes. It's an act of sin by doing this, by issuing this order and this threat, and it's rebellion against God, because God said, no worshiping idols. And he says that not just to believers, but to the entire human race. We pointed that out. The scriptures teach people that God has delegated authority to certain men to govern the affairs of certain members of the human race and to carry out capital punishment of those individuals who commit capital crimes. Capital punishment is taught in the Old Testament and it's taught in the New. Romans 13, 1 through 7 and 1 Peter 2, 3. Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6 records for us the establishment of the fourth and final uh, divine institution, which is government, human government, and also Capital punishment. Go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. I'm going to bring out something here, and I'm going to uh, refute what some people in, in the world today say about capital punishment. Because here we have a classic example, which a, a person who's against the cap- capital punishment, they'll use this as a clear example of why we shouldn't have capital punishment, because a madman like that will use it, and use it unjustified. Well, the Word of God has something to say about this. Look at Genesis chapter 9. Now, this is after Noah has come out of the ark and only his family, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and, De- Shem, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their families made it through the flood. They're, the only, they're all believers. And Noah, nobody else made it. Now, this is what God tells them to do after. A lot of interesting things happen in the first six verses here. This is the Noah covenant, the covenant that God made with Noah. Genesis 9.1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Again, a repeat of what he said to Adam and Eve. And they would do this. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Now, of course, a lot of times with animals today, uh, they get, when they're around humans enough, they don't get afraid of human beings. They get familiar with them, which becomes a dangerous situation for human beings. But inherently, God has given them this fear of mankind. It's written into their DNA. Look at verse 3. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. Prior to the, prior to the flood, everybody was a vegetarian. And I give all to you as I have green, given the green plant. So basically, then he says, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So they had to drain it of its blood. So there they became man-eaters, when prior to that, they were all vegetarians. We studied this in the past. Now look what he says. Surely, and this is a key phrase, I will require. This is what God demands. And this is the key to understanding capital punishment. Surely, I will require your lifeblood 
God requires it. From every beast, I will require it. And from every man, from, and from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. And he explains, whoever sheds man's blood, whether it's an animal or another human being, by man, his blood shall be shed. Now, prior to the flood, remember Cain killed his brother? Nobody executed him. God didn't execute him. Well, reason why God hadn't put this out there yet. Now he put it out there. Now he expects it to be carried out. For in, and this is the why, this is why God demands capital punishment. For in the image of God, he made man. Now notice God said, I require it. See, when we want to talk about discussions about capital punishment and whether we should have it or not, you can't have the discussion, unless, you have to bring theology into it. You can't bring, you cannot bring it in. You have to bring it in because God's the one who requires it. And you have to bring God into the situation. You, have, you, can't, you can't win the argument. I mean, you can try to win the argument, but the argument is cinched because God said it. God said he requires it. So God demands somebody executed. What, what about if the person's a madman like Nebuchadnezzar? Well, we'll find out. Look, he says, and then he says in verse six, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. So capital punishment is the lawful taking of human life, again, the lawful taking of human life by the civil or military authorities. The death penalty was inflicted by all nations in the ancient world. It's only till recently in the last hundred years, like America, that we don't practice it. And you know what you got now? Just this is what you got. You guys got, you got people out there eating people, man eaters. A guy ate guy's face. He, he, I mean, he, he, they found these, you see how these things on the news? Guys e eating people. They would not be tolerated. They'd be executed. You, you can't allow your daughter to walk down even a, a, a city street, a, a small town like Cedar Rabbits late at night. You can't, you can't allow, you, you have to lock your houses. You have to, you have, to uh, have police armed to the hilt. I mean, in Marion, this little town, you got the police. They got the whole thing like you're in a, in a city, like where I came from, like 30,000 people in the town where they have the, uh, the, you know, they go in there and they, what do they call those things? Uh, Titus, help me out. The big, uh, you know, they go in there and they come through the door and had a buddy who just, SWAT. They have a SWAT team in, in Marion. I mean, they don't even have 10, they don't even have, what, we don't even have 13,000 people in town, do we? Maybe. Whole yeah. I don't know, just Marion. And Miriam police had this. What do I, why, I bring that up because, because it's a dangerous world. People are running around crazy. And they, you know what? Murderers get away all the time. They get out. They, 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 there's guys that get out on, uh, after a couple of years, and they're killers. And that we're, running, we're letting these people run wild. And we're an armed fortress now. Our jails. We spend trillions and billions of dollars on jails. And these guys, and what? And your tax dollars are going to these people. A lot of these guys, if they've gone to a court of law and they've been proven guilty, execute them. Execute them. Now, what if the guy, what if it's a wrong? Well, that doesn't mean you throw the baby out with a bathwater and get rid of the death penalty because some judge or some jury made a wrong decision. God doesn't say that. Think about this. Does God understand about unjust behavior? Does, has, has, has God himself ever experience injustice from the government. Think about it. Titus is laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. Jesus did. Did Jesus say on the cross, that's it, I'm doing away with the death penalty. I got a bad deal. Did he? Did he say no more capital punishment because Herod and, uh, and uh, the Jewish Sanhedrin and, the, and Pilate were stupid? Did he say, that's it, we're throwing, we're throwing the whole thing out because you screwed up in this one instance. You screwed up with me. No, God, Jesus Christ, God, who gave Noah this command, he says, no, I still want it in place. I still want it in place because no government and no capital punishment is, is much, much worse. You know why? Look at the antediluvian period. It was anarchy. You had vigilantes. You thought Charles Bronson and, 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 and uh, who are all the vigilante movies? And Clint Eastwood? Oh my gosh. They had more vigilantes during the antediluvian period when Noah walked the earth because everybody just, they just solved their own things. It was like the, the wild, wild west. See, if you have no government, 
Anarchy is worse, God says. So even though a government, and our government, because in the, in the different states, when they don't practice capital punishment, that's one of their major, major things. In fact, the major thing they should be doing for its citizens, and they're not in this country, is they're doing away with the death penalty. So what do we have in the last 100 years? Craziness in our country. Look at the, look at the money that's poured into prisons, the money that's poured into uh, 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 law enforcement. We're, our, we're like military, the police, forget about Andy Griffith, now it's the SWAT team. That's what's come, become, why? Because we, we don't believe in capital punishment. And you know why we don't believe in capital punishment? Because we've rejected the word of God, because that's who it, where it comes from, God. So we have here, I brought you, uh, look at Romans 13, uh, Jody's favorite chapter, or I should say book, Romans 13, I don't know about if it's her favorite chapter. Look at Romans 13, look at verse 1. So we got a, a situation here where God says he's delegated authority to certain men like Nebuchadnezzar to execute people, criminals, guilty of capital crimes. Sometimes, though, they, don't, they execute the wrong people. They, in fact, they execute people for unjustified reasons. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yet God doesn't do away with capital punishment. He doesn't do it at all. He uses the whole situation for his own glory, as we'll see. Romans 13, 1. Every person, you speaking to Christians, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That means the president. And if he's a Democrat and you don't like Democrats, or if he's a Republican or a Libertarian or whatever, an Independent, doesn't matter. You go by principle in God's word. Obey him because God's, he's God's servant. Look at it says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. To reject authority is to reject God who's the author of authority. And those who, which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil, do you want to have no fear of authority? We're talking, Titan and I are driving around today, and he goes, we're talking about the, uh, in Cedar Rapids, they made a big deal because this camera is out, and they're catching all these people who are speeding. They even caught cops that were, sp police officers that were speeding. And we were like, I don't care if they have cameras. It doesn't matter to me because I'm just going to the speed limit. Stick it on cruise, people. Here's a good, I used to be, I used to speed a lot too when I was younger. Then I came to Matt, uh, Iowa, and the word of God in Iowa showed me the light. Now when I go back to Massachusetts, I feel like I'm like granny. Eeeh, you know? I am. They would run you off the road in Massachusetts. I know old ladies who'd run off da uh, Dale Earnhardt if he was still alive. They'd run him off the road. These the people in Massachusetts, old ladies in Massachusetts who whip his butt or whoever's out there in NASCAR today because he's crazy son of a gun out there. Rhode Island too. That, like yeah, Alice Lasasso. Ooh, she's a crazy driver out there, I heard. Just kidding, Alice. So we see that... <laughs> so we see that... Uh, Stick it on cruise. There's one. When it says 35, stick it on cruise at 35 and you'll get there. You don't have to worry about them pulling you over. See, that's what he's talking about. If you live in fear, you're breaking the law, you're speeding, of course you're going to live in fear of the authorities. And good, I hope they get you. For, for rulers, for rulers, verse 3, are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good. Obey the law. And you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. You hear that? But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God. President Obama is a servant of God. He's a servant of God. And so is the governors of the various states in this country. In fact, whoever is the leader of Russia and China, they're servants of God too. Think about that. Think spiritual. Spiritual person knows that, believes that, and has that conviction. A person who is involved in the cosmic system rejects all that. And if you have a hard time with that, listen, listen. Let, ask God to help you see the light. Really. 
because that's what it says. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor. So there we have uh, the death penalty was given by God, to, uh, delegated to uh, rulers, civil rulers, civil authorities, and, and it was p- to be practiced uh, on those who are guilty of capital crimes. In Israel, the main method of executing somebody was stoning. Amongst other nations, other forms such as hanging, beheading, and crucifixion, or burning somebody alive in a furnace like Nebuchadnezzar was used. The ultimate authority for the death penalty, as we saw in Genesis 9, is God alone. Now, in Old Testament Israel, there were very, and we're not in Old Testament Israel because there'd be a lot of dead people right now in our country. In Old Testament Israel, there were various causes of the death penalty. One, sacrilege. Two, serious abuse of one's parents. Number three, adultery. They executed people in Israel for committing adultery. Bla- Remember, David committed it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Blasphemy is one, another reason why people were executed in Israel. Immorality, kidnapping, murder, rebellion, Sabbath breaking, witchcraft, rape of a betrothed virgin, and bestiality, that's having sex with animals, and child sacrifice. Now, numbers, now you can always, when you talk about capital punishment in the Bible, you got to compare scripture with scripture and get the whole picture. Numbers, chapter 35, verses 30 through 34, along with Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7, and Deuteronomy 19, 15, teach that capital punishment cannot take place unless there are two or more witnesses to the crime, and that they all agree in their testimony after being individually interviewed. Now, the fact that capital punishment was instituted does not mean that there's never to be an exception to the punishment of, the, of execution for the crime of murder. With God, remember, justice may be tempered with mercy in response to the re- repentance of the criminal. What, example, David. He's guilty of a capital pri- crime, murder and adultery. He should have been dead. How come God didn't kill him? In David's case, David was guilty of ca- the capital crimes of murder and adultery in the case of Uriah and Bathsheba, respectively, and God forgave David when he confessed his sin. And thus David, instead of dying by stoning or the sword as he deserved, 1 Chronicles 29, 28 says, he died in a good old age full of days and riches and honor, end of quote. Now what I'm telling you is this. This is something we should take into consideration. If a guy is, is guilty of a capital crime like murder or whatever, kidnapping, then if he's and if he shows some repentance and he's his change of attitude or whatever, this has got to be determined by the judge. May, it might not be possible. I don't know if it's possible, but if it, if it's possible, then the judge cannot give give him the death penalty. So we know that because that's what God did with David. So that we see here that a judge or a governor is warranted and taking such mitigating factors as may exist in a given situation into consideration and determining a sentence legal penalty of capital punishment. So, the Bible does teach that there are certain circumstances in which the Christian is justified in disobeying the governmental authorities. This is called civil disobedience, or as I like to call, justified civil disobedience. There's a lot of civil disobedience going on among Christians today that is unjustified, meaning it's not biblical. So we have, I'm bringing you to this because it's setting us up for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they're going to be justified in disobeying the king. They're going to be involved in justified civil disobedience. So what is civil disobedience as we close? It's the performance of an int- intentional act that is prohibited by the civil authorities or a refusal to perform an act that is required by the civil authority. Christians, remember, are commanded by to obey God, but they're also told, as we saw in Romans 13 and, and Titus 3, 1, and 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, we're told to obey the governing authorities. Now the question as happens, what happens? What happens if there's a conflict between the two? Civil disobedience becomes an issue for the Christian when these two claims upon the Christian come into conflict, obeying God and obeying the civil authorities. When God commands us to do something, like proclaim the gospel or teach the word of God, and the civil authorities prohibit this, 
What is the solution? Obey God. We saw that with the, the, the midwives in, e, in Egypt. When the midwives were told to execute the baby boys, the infant Jewish boys, that's murder. And they refused to do that. They were justified in doing that. It would be like to, uh, Hitler's Germany. You know they're killing the Jews. Don't give them up. And a lot of Christians didn't give them up. In fact, a lot of the people who followed Charles Darby's teaching, who, believed in, uh, who were dispensationalists that believed in the distinction between Israel and the church, they protected the Jews because they, they, they knew they were God's people and God was going to use them in the future and that he had not uh, abandoned Israel, as Paul said in Romans 9, 10, and 11. So we see here that we, uh, in, in Nazi Germany, if you know that the, the, Hitler's, the, the Nazis are killing the Jews, you'd hide them. And that's what a lot of people did. And some people didn't hide them. And they gave them up, which was sin if they, for a Christian to do and sin for an unbeliever to do, for that matter. Because you, you, you're giving them over to a known murderer. So what do you do in that situation? You'll rebel against, you say no. You don't do it. So the, it, we saw this, the solution of the, again in the conflict is if God says to obey him and then the civil authorities say, God says to obey the civil authorities, if the civil authorities are telling you uh, to do what Daniel and his three friends were told to do, worship a gold statue, which is idolatry, you obey God and you don't commit idolatry. That's the solution. Uh, we also saw in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, when the apostles were commanded by the Jewish authorities to not proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what did Peter tell them? We must obey God rather than men. In Exodus chapter 1, as I mentioned, the midwives disobeyed Pharaoh of Egypt's command to murder infant boys who were born to the Israelite women since murder is against the law of God. Genesis 9, 5 and 6 as we saw. In Daniel chapter 3 here, we see Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refusing to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up, and they were justified in doing so. Why? Because God prohibited the Israelites, and he does us. He prohibits us from committing idolatry. Daniel chapter 6, we're going to see that the civil authorities prohibited Daniel from praying to the God of Israel. And Daniel correctly disobeyed because obeying God is required if the civil authorities contradict God or prohibit the Christian from obeying God. Now, uh, I, if, if, I'll tell you something. In today's day and age, if a kid's in school, he's a Christian kid, and he's at lunch, and he decides to pray over his food, and the teacher comes over and says, you can't pray, I'm saying, I'm praying. You can throw me out of school, and I'll take it, and, uh, and there should be a big case over that, because that's wrong. The civil authorities have no right to tell you you can't pray. Now, if the kid... Is it's a time for class, he shouldn't be in the middle. Oh, I'm praying, you know, it's an excuse not to do the work. That's wrong for the Christian to do. But if he's praying over his food, if he's got, uh, he's on his break at work, if you're on your break at work or whatever, you know, pray, you know, you could pray on your own time. Uh, if the kid's taking a, t taking a test, there's nothing wrong with the kid, uh, you know, praying uh, while he's taking the test or even praying while he's doing taking the test. And if the teacher says not to, sorry, disobey the teacher. Because you have every right to pray. The authorities have no right to tell you you can't pray. They have no business tell telling you that. Absolutely none. So uh, we see here that this is a case. I mean, these are issues. You know, it's interesting. Maybe God's getting the church ready for something that's coming up. Now, in our country right now, we got no situations where President Obama is saying worship a statue of him. Okay. We got nothing where they're telling us not to proclaim the gospel. But I'll tell you another thing. What's going on, though, what could be going on that could very well happen, and it's very subtle, is not a full frontal attack. What they're going to do is they're going to take, I mentioned this before, and they're going to take guys, they're going to say things like, if you say, if a pastor, and they get, they're going to try to pull this through. It's called a hate crime. They want to say, if a pastor comes out, and there's a big deal down in North Carolina, guy taught that homosexuality is wrong. The Bible says it's condemned. It's abomination. And the, everybody's jumping on him, right? Well, good. He's persecuted for righteousness sake if he's, that's the case. But we see that they want to make that a hate crime if one of us pastors say homosexuality is sin. They want to make that a hate crime. They think that you're, they want to say, they want to say that you're promoting uh, homophobia, they like to call it. <laughs> they, you're promoting uh, hatred toward homosexuals. See how subtle that is? You know what's going to happen if that comes through? And I wouldn't be surprised that's going to happen, something like that. 
if that happens, you know where Pastor Bill's going to be. He's going to be in a jail cell with Bubba, you know? And so you guys got to come and visit me when I'm there with Bubba, you know, this big black guy, you know, Bubba. And so that, that could very well happen. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Am I going to compromise and say, oh, geez, I don't want to go to jail. But God says you, gotta, you can't, you can't, uh, you, can't uh, you have to preach the word of God. And they have no right to tell you, and we, see, we, what the case would be is that, well, the Bible t- teaches us that that's sin. I'm not saying, I'm not, you're, you're the one who's trying to, they're trying to twist it around and make it as a hate crime. That's not a hate crime because I disagree with their lifestyle and this, what their acts, they're disgusting. That doesn't mean I hate them. In the same breath, I'm saying God so loved the world that he died on the cross for the homosexual and the lesbian. So that's some of the things that's coming down the pike here in our generation. We probably have a, might have a confrontation, uh, which might be a very good thing for the church. Maybe some Christians will start waking up and taking seriously what's going on around them. But maybe not. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll compromise like so many Christians, uh, you know, when the, if Christians do today. If they can't, as I brought this out last week, and I'd love to bring this up, if it's nice and, it's nice and peaceful in America now and Christians are still uh, are compromising with the devil's world, What's going to happen when their lives are being threatened for obeying God? You, what do you think they're going to do? If they can't take it in good times and obey God, and they're compromising then, what are they going to do when the real pressure happens? I'll tell you what they're going to do. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm hiding. So, again, it brings us right back around to what? Do I obey God? Even if, am I ready for the consequences for obeying God? Because it could cost me my job. It could cost me my marriage. It could cost me my girlfriend, my boyfriend. It could cost me money. It could cost me a lot of things. It could, it could cost me right reputation in town. As I said before, those who are following Jesus, at some point, it's cost you something if you're following Jesus. If you're not following Jesus and is his disciple, it hasn't cost you anything. So these things we, we're going to continue to develop and we'll develop tomorrow morning further, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow evening. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would c- encourage us and challenge us and rebuke us if necessary, instruct us in righteousness through this teaching we heard this evening. And we pray, Father, that the message would transform your people and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen.